Hello, hello there, everyone. Yeah. So Kiara beside me and uh, Dr. Javier Plasmendis from Hello. Europe. Hello. And the rest are our cadets mostly. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So it's 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 been an exciting couple of days, and I have been really enjoying uh, oh, all the talks. Uh, of, uh, some of the talks. Yes, yes, I have been uh, pretty much logged in. Uh, oh. It's only when I have some other meetings I don't listen, but otherwise, essentially, it's playing in the background throughout the day uh, in the lab. <laughs> in the, uh, group. Yes, yes. So we started the introduction. Aerospace engineer. Aerospace engineer. As a postdoctoral lead at Center in Nitro at the year, Golden Day Mines Department, Mines Paris Day. After obtaining his PhD from Texas AM University, he's also an ISC alumnus, having received his master's from NMCAD lab. He was a recipient of the Young Faculty Award in IIT Bombay. He specializes in structures with primary research areas being mechanics of materials, textile composites, development of computational models, characterizing materials like metals, metallic alloys, and composites. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, although, like I uh, mentioned in the email, the presentation will be delivered uh, by my uh, graduate student, uh, Puni, uh, who is um, also joined us online. Uh, Puneet is about to submit his thesis and uh, will soon be flying to USA uh, to begin his uh, postdoc. Uh, and uh, the work which will be presented is primarily the work that he did as part of his uh, PhD uh, work. Uh, so, so I will be, of course, actively participating in the discussions uh, as well uh, right now. So Puneet, I request you to kindly share your screen. So while he is sharing the screen, uh, Puneet, after his uh, bachelor's, joined IIT Bombay as uh, MTech student. Um, he was an excellent MTech student, and he decided to convert his MTech into PhD. Uh, and um, his work primarily initially uh, was restricted only to looking at um, thin pre-twisted strips in the presence of delamination and wave propagation through these strips. However, uh, he decided to take up uh, additional work where uh, the results from uh, the first set of work was eventually used to develop a uh, model uh, and then look at wave propagation in general open and closed section uh, strips and beams in the presence of delamination and, of course, wave propagation through these structures uh, as well. Uh, needless to say, uh, the entire work is completely motivated and inspired by uh, the seminal work of Professor uh, Harur Sampath uh, that he did uh, uh, first as part of his PhD work and later on with some of his other students, um, including uh, Harish, uh, I believe, uh, later on. So, so uh, the entire uh, credit to this to a large extent should go to Professor Harur Sampar as well. Uh, so, Puneet, I request you to now please uh, take over and uh, deliver your uh, seminar. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, good afternoon, Tom. Uh, um, so I'll be presenting my work that I've done my, during my PhD. Um, so the, this will be the brief outline of the presentation that, I, that I'll be making today. So I'll go through some of the introduction on the importance of the on the importance of knowing the deal uh, the delaminated beams or delaminated strips. Then I'll uh, brief a little about the modeling method that we have followed in this uh, in this work. And the dynamics, the method that we have used in that for the dynamic analysis for pre twisted strip and also for open and closed cross section beams. And I'll also finally discuss some results that we have obtained in the process. So, if we look at any aircraft structures, so we, we see that uh, thin wall beams are 
extensively used in the wings, in the radars, in the, sorry, in the wings, and and in the fuselage section, and in all in 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 building the complete aircraft. And so, uh, any any uh, three-dimensional object needs to be analyzed as uh, statically as well as dynamically to understand the behavior of these materials when they are put into function in uh, aircraft or any other moving. Moving parts in automobiles or in any other in other applications, so that's that's the importance of analyzing or looking into the thin wall beams. And when it comes to composites, we know that many of the aircraft comp of the aircraft structures are being continuously replaced by comp by composite materials. And currently, we are at like uh, currently even 50% of the aircrafts are be being built by composites, and these. Uh, composites are are located in uh, located in a very critical uh, parts such as in the wing section, in the uh, elevator sections. So these are uh, subjected to continuous dynamic aerodynamic loads. Uh, so these are subjected to air because of these aerodynamic loads, they are um, prone to damages. So one of the frequent damages that are found in the composites are the delamination. Which are the uh, yeah sorry yeah this delamination can also be uh, induced during the manufacturing techniques because of improper penetration of the matrix material throughout the region. So uh, these small delaminations were have been detected when after the manufacturing. And uh, even during the low, during the service of an airplane, so it's important to detect and also know how much how how effective or how the structure would, the structural behavior would change in presence of this delaminations. So it's uh, that's the reason why we took in, we took the topic of re, uh, studying the delamination in such thin structures. So, uh, so the final aim was the final goal was to study the wave propagation so that this delamination can be can can be detected in the uh, open and close cross section beams. Uh, to achieve this, uh, we have we were we have modeled this uh, to a to an equivalent one D beam, and we have formulated this using the uh, normal Hamiltonian procedure, and we have validated this with. Various literature and simulation and uh, 3D uh, simulations, and we also have done few analysis of the validated models. So on the outline, uh, so the thin structures we had, we can uh, uh, the thin the thin sorry the thin structures can be uh, either a plate or a shell or a beam. So here in this study, we have only considered strips and open and closed cross section beams. Again, these uh, strips are 1D reducible, whereas plates and shells are reducible to equal and 2D models. So we are here. We are uh, studying uh, particularly those composite models which can be reduced to an equivalent 1D structure. Uh, so uh, this again can be. Uh, uh, this again is grouped into strips, st studying of strips and uh, studying of open and closed cross section beams, which are which can be uh, termed as a collection of strips. And for which we have performed both static and dynamic analysis. So, uh, as we all know, there are numerous uh, beam theories already that exist in the literature. Uh, so, uh, uh, like the classical beam theories, and also some other beam theories which introduces shear correction in the model to uh, uh, to effectively ca capture the uh, she uh, the shear bending and the uh, torsion of the beams. And they have they have been uh, there have been models such as uh, Carrara Unified Theory model and generalized beam theory model where the displacements are more generalized in terms of polynomial uh, and the and and the, um, the the solution can be obtained by by slowly moving to by slowly increasing the polynomial degree and uh, by converging to a particular solution. So, uh, but in this work, we have uh, moved on to we have considered more uh, of variational asymptotic method, uh, which I'll be explaining further on the uh, further. 
Uh, again, based on the modeling approaches, there is Newton approach method where we consider the equilibrium of a section and uh, to to have to find to model the beam. And we have virtual work approach and variational method. Uh, but in in this method, we have uh, uh, we have we are using variational asymptotic method as it is more easier to uh, uh, obtain a more convergent solution for an equivalent beam that compared to other models. So uh, to explain the variational asymptotic method in brief, uh, so it's it's a mathematical procedure where a defined where a defined functional can be minimized uh, and uh, where the defined functional is can be minimized and the solution for the minimized functional can be obtained by identifying the small parameters. So in this procedure, the initially functional is defined and in our case, in the in the case of uh, strips and open cross section cross section beam strain energy will be our functional and the small parameters um, of these of the strips or beams would be the uh, the width to the width to the thickness ratio and the uh, and the pre twist uh, and uh, the this this small uh, parameters are used uh, to uh, to express other strain terms so that we know the order of all the strain terms or of or, or of all the displacement term that contributes towards the strain energy. So once we know the strain energy, so we can next uh, uh, so minimize the strain energy to find the solutions of unknowns in the strain energy. So um, in, the, in, in this problem, so we have a local displacements or warpings uh, as the unknowns, which should which has to be determined in terms of uh, global global displacements or in terms of uh, rigid displacements. So uh, the local warpings are the uh, the local displacements in the cross section, which can be expressed in terms of the global displacements. So by 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 continuously following the loop, we can find uh, we can uh, we can asymptotically uh, find the solution for the local displacements in terms of. Uh, the uh, look the global or global or the rigid body displacements so in this way uh, the all, once we have the local displacement solution in terms of the global displacements the model can be reduced to an equivalent 1d beam so initially uh, we uh, we uh, did it for a strip so where a strip with a uh, with a delamination uh, with a symmetric delamination on the both the sides were considered so initially we'll have a functional uh, three dimensional functional which is the uh, 6 cross 6 uh, sorry which is a three which is a which is a multiplication of uh, uh, the strain matrix and the uh, stiffness matrix and using the uh, clpt we can reduce the three dimensional energy functional to an equivalent two dimensional energy functional and further again by using var we have reduced it to one dimensional in which case where the u one dimensional strain energy can be represented in terms of linear strains uh, which consists of axial strain and the curvatures and the non linear strains um, which would consist the higher power of the linear strain terms uh, to model this uh, so uh, to model this um, initially it was start uh, we started using uh, through beam kinematics uh, so here in the first equation the Position vector of the undefined the position vector of a cross section in the undeformed configuration is expressed, and the position vector of the cross section in the deformed configuration is expressed in equation two. So uh, we have considered uh, the global displacements ui and the local cross sectional displacements wi, or uh, which are uh, termed as warping here, and the uh, the rotational terms phi one and phi two. And the uh, the poison and and the other effects due to uh, poison's effects. So using the, uh, the using the position vectors, we can find the deformation gradient and subsequently the strains uh, the three D strains of the uh, of, of an of a of an equivalent strip. So these three D strains can be now expressed in terms of two D strains using CLPT. Uh, so he, these are the two uh, D strains uh, that we obtained from the uh, by by following the beam kinematics, so the here the underlying terms are the nonlinear terms that would uh, uh, eventually come in the higher order or the first order of the uh, uh, of the uh, variational asymptotic method. 
So uh, once we have this, so once we have this strain in terms of uh, two, yeah, once we have the strain terms, we can uh, uh, substitute back in the two dimensional energy equation and minimize the uh, strain energy equation uh, for to find the uh, and follow the variational approach method to find the uh, local displacements or the uh, warpings W1, W2, and W3. So under the constraints that the warpings are the, under the constraints that the average warpings are uh, zero, the average of warpings are zero in the cross section, which are defined using equation five and six. So upon uh, following variation uh, principles, we we get the equilibrium equations uh, mentioned in the four and ones uh, which will be helpful in solving the warpings W1, W2, and W3. So using this, uh, we can find W1, W2, W3 in terms of the strains gamma 1, 1, kappa 3, kappa 1, and kappa 2, which are the, again, uh, the 1D curvatures associated with the strip. So once we have the local warpings in terms of these strains, uh, then the one-dimensional energy can be obtained in terms of linear strains as well as non-linear strains. So th this is then uh, overall modeling approach for an uh, strip. Um, and for the open cross section beams, uh, we know that the, the most famous, the, the most widely used uh, theory is the St. Vernon's uh, theory, which uh, which you and the other uh, th and other solutions, be, which are again based on the warping solutions and additional warping that are used uh, to 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 uh, to capture the uh, blast of effects in open and closed cross section beams. Uh, so uh, there are again uh, closed closed form solution methods uh, which has been which have been proposed by many authors. Uh, I'll not get into the details of it, but again, uh, and even computational methods are available uh, based on the uh, based on generalized uh, theory and uh, based on generalized beam theory and also some uh, computational models which uses finite element methods. So even these models can be used to find to find the uh, equivalent stiffness of the material. So uh, next, moving on to the open and closed cross section. So uh, in the previous uh, in the previous modeling uh, method, in the previous modeling case, we had considered a single strip in which the global coordinates and local coordinates were same. But now we are considering a strip which with a global coordinate and local coordinate uh, uh, are different. So here, the local coordinate is of of the strip is is oriented at an angle of alpha, and it's this and it's placed at a uh, distance of x n two and x n three from the origin. So this strip can be can can be looked into can be considered as a structural genome of an any open and closed cross section, because if we look into an uh, in of an airfoil or an of an any open or closed section beam. Uh, this airfoil can be considered as an assembly of many such uh, small strips attached uh, attached along the width. So a single strip orient a uh, general uh, or a strip then now becomes the structural genome for any open and closed cross section beams. So the, again, a similar procedure as explained for um, um, as explained for uh, uh, for a strip is used again to find the warpings to find the warping of solution for the uh, general strip uh, oriented at an angle. So again, now the position vectors changes because of the uh, difference in the global and the local coordinates, and the position vectors are expressed in terms of the orientation angle alpha and the displacements xn1, xn2, and xn3. And again, the procedure of finding the strains and, and again following the variational approach remains the same. So uh, and uh, we get the similar kind of, exp uh, but now, yeah, but now uh, we we would get um, we can get as more as six cross six uh, strain strain one D strain matrix for an open and closed cross section beam. Uh, so I'll not get go again to the same procedure. So it's same as what I had discussed earlier. So for in any general open and cross section beam, so we have now developed an algorithm uh, to compute the uh, stiffness of the beam in presence and with, uh, which, uh, with the presence of partial uh, delamination and in the absence of partial delamination. So uh, given the geometric and material properties, 
we can find the warping solutions uh, uh, which are analytical solutions but uh, which uh, but uh, now these analytical solutions are also dependent on the continuity or the geometry of the uh, cross section so this once the warpings are found can be uh, once the warping are found then the one dimensional uh, strain energy can be found using an algorithm uh, that i have uh, shown here uh, so once we have the um, one dimensional equivalent one dimensional beam, uh, we can uh, again uh, use a variational approach to find the uh, to find then uh, to get the governing equ differential equations for the beam. Uh, with so equation number eight are the governing differential equations for any general beam for for an one D equivalent uh, structure. So here M P one M one M two are the distributed forces which would um, be, which would assume either a dynamical load or static loads, depending on the analysis that we perform. So next, for, for, to, for, to do the transient analysis, uh, although um, uh, we, can, we can follow finite element method or differential quadrature method, so we have followed a spectral finite element method uh, because in this method, the, the displacements are expressed in, are expressed in terms of uh, the frequency in the frequency domain and they are expressed in the wave number domain so that the number of elements that are required to compute the transient response of a beam uh, decreases as we are eliminating the requirement of small uh, time discretization as well as small element discretization using spectral finite element method so that's the reason we are using spectral finite element method to increase the computational time as well so, uh, uh, so in the spectral finite element method, the, the, all the displacements are expressed in 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 the uh, are expressed by following the Fourier transforms in the frequency domain and in the wave number domain. And these uh, frequent so these displacements can be further be represented in the uh, using uh, eigenvectors and the eigenvalues uh, may, uh, populated in the uh, uh, matrix D. So uh, once we have the once we have this uh, uh, the the displacements in terms of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, this can be uh, replaced back in the governing equations, which would re now reduce the equation of beam the partial differential equation of the beam to an ordinary differential equation. So uh, now the uh, the ordinary differential equation can be easily solved in the Fourier domain, and the solution in the time domain can be obtained by performing in inverse Fourier transform. So uh, initially we have done the stiffness validation for an uh, I section beam which has uh, uh, both uh, which has a coupling with uh, uh, which has elastic couplings in uh, axial and uh, torsional elastic couplings. Uh, so this was the beam that's being used uh, by used in for the in in the experimentation as well as in many other literature works. Uh, so we have compared our results with the uh, results from uh, Professor Haru Sampat's paper as well as uh, Professor Yu's paper, uh, which is a, a more of a computational model. So we were able to. Uh, capture all the uh, elastic displacement to a very good uh, approximation uh, and we have even uh, uh, now calculated the uh, the equivalent to 1d stiffness for uh, uh, for uh, for airfoil uh, which uh, with with a uh, with a different composite uh, distribution throughout the throughout the cross section so here the airfoil has a different uh, composite distribution at the leading edge in the webs and in the trialing edges and we have compared the stiffness with the other computational models such as WAPS and MSV and uh, we can we can see that the all the results are very much closer to what we have obtained the 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 difference between our model and the other model is very less and uh, we have even uh, perf uh, performed the validation static validation for with the experiments uh, experimental uh, results that were uh, that that was reported by uh, chandra and others um, so our model was able to closely predict the experimental results as well for this was for an i section beam for which the stiffness validation has been uh, was shown earlier and this for this one was for an 
uh, box section B. Uh, again, we have uh, validated for uh, for various loads. Uh, the top two shows the 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 first one shows the the bending response of a box beam under a bending load, and the right one shows the bending slope in under a torsional uh, uh, load. So we can see the the given the coupling in the box kind of beams are captured to a very good uh, approximation. Uh, from uh, compared to experimental. So again, uh, these are again under the uh, these are again a uh, two different box beam loads under uh, different loading conditions. And we have even done the uh, experiment. Sorry, the simulation validation for uh, delaminated beams. So we have considered a partial delamination for an I section beam in the flanges, it, and we have the tor under a torsional load. And we had considered the uh, same delamination. Uh, so here the only the delamination was considered in the top right flange, uh, where the delamination had not propagated throughout the flange, but it was propagated only to 50% of the flange width. Uh, so that we we can see that from both the results of flexural as well as torsional loads are closely uh, matching to the 3D finite element simulations. And similarly, uh, we, the, the third uh, figure corresponds to the uh, response of a box beam under uh, delamination. Uh, so uh, this are uh, so again uh, we have uh, we I'd like to present some uh, cases uh, showing the stiffness change, the stiffness values for different cases. So in case one, we had considered a delamination uh, only in the right flange, uh, right top flange. And uh, and the in the case two we had considered uh, the delamination in the both uh, in, here multiple delaminations are considered one in the right flange and one in the bottom flange and in the case three we have seen the we have considered the delamination in the web so uh, the the delamination in the case of web is not predominant or is not uh, doesn't display any. Uh, 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 any drastic changes in the stiffness compared to the uh, uh, compared to the delamination if it's present in the uh, flange cases. So we uh, even uh, we uh, we have plotted the various stiffness uh, for uh, uh, in, with respect to the pre twist. So as the pre twist changes, the stiffness also should. I mean, we expect the stiffness to change as the pre twist changes. So we ex we we can see a similar changes in the pre twist. Sorry, in the stiffness in the extension and the torsional stiffness uh, with respect to the pre twist. But when there is a delamination, the 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 coupling effect increases rather than decreasing. Whereas the the whereas the pure torsional stiffness decreases when there is a delamination and we see a non a non linear dependent of the uh, stiffness on the uh, pre twist both in uh, both during the delamination and without delamination and again uh, again these are the uh, other stiffness uh, other stiffness parameters so we again we see the extension and the flexural couple in stiffness uh, did not behave the same as what we have seen in the case for an extension and torsional stiffness because in the uh, torsional and uh, uh, um, flexural coupled stiffness, the de with, when there is a delamination, the stiffness reduces with the pre-twist rather than increase, but rather than increasing the stiffness. So uh, such many cases can be studied, and this is for an a box kind of for a box section beam. Uh, here we see a contradicting uh, uh, where we can observe the contradiction, the contradicting results of, uh, compared to the I section beam. Here, in in the presence of delamination, the the extension and axial coupling is reducing rather than uh, increasing what we had seen in the previous study. Uh, so again, uh, we uh, again the uh, the torsional stiffness would. Almost remain the change and the decrease in the torsional stiffnesses uh, due to uh, delamination uh, is 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 like around one percent. Uh, but whereas in open section beams, it's uh, more. Uh, it's more than five percent. So next, we have uh, uh, even uh, performed few uh, validation model val uh, validation. 
uh, for to, uh, for that uh, for the strips uh, from the experiments as well as from the FEM model. So these were the few experimental results, um, uh, and our model was able to predict the uh, results to a very good uh, approximation. Again, for this is for an uh, delaminated B, delaminated strips uh, compared with the FEM results. Again, we have very good comparison with the FEM results. And using that, we can now perform model analysis for various dimensions of delaminations, uh, the partial delamination. So, and we can observe the, the all we can observe the natural frequencies decreasing at a different uh, rates depending on the mode that has that has to be considered. But usually, we can observe the torsional and this planwise modes are the one which are uh, which shows a very rapid decrease in the natural frequency compared to normal flexural modes. Again, uh, now once we uh, have the uh, pre-twisted, uh, for once we have for the pre-twisted beam, we can perform again parametric studies for uh, different uh, pre-twist ratios as well as for the different uh, delamination dimensions. Uh, and again, uh, although we have uh, take in in the in the figures on the left and the right, although the dimensions of the beams are the same, the layups are different. So we can observe that for one set of layup, the the natural frequencies are decreasing uh, with the pre-twist, but for another set of layup, the natural frequencies are increasing. So this shows that uh, it's not necessary that as the pre-twist changes, as the pre-twist increases, the torsional frequency has to increase. So it is now depend it is dependent on the layup, and with the pre-twist, it also because because and in the presence of delamination because the coupling is affected by the delamination the it's 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 more difficult to generalize the uh, the uh, the behavior of uh, natural frequency in in the presence of delamination and pre twist it's more complicated in the presence of both delamination and pre twist and uh, for even for the open and closed cross section beam uh, we have done uh, uh, the um, validation for an C section beam in the table one and for an I section beam in table two, and also with the FEM results in the third table uh, with uh, with our model. So our mo yeah, so uh, we were having very close results even with the FEM and the experimental results. And again, for the close cross section beam, uh, we have done the validation for a uh, closed cross section pipe for an uh, uh, NACA 001 symmetric airfoil and for the box cross section B with the experimental results and other uh, computational models as well. So, from this, we can see that our, model, our 1D model and the 3D model that's, that can be developed in Abacus or in, uh, in other computational models are equivalent. Uh, so uh, yeah, these results showed that the equivalence between our 3D, between our uh, equivalent 1D model that's uh, derived using VAM and the 3D models in, uh, in the sense. And now we have performed the uh, delamination study again in the foreign uh, I section beam. And now the because now the the number of cases are are uh, many. And we have, have shown results for just a four cases uh, that had already that for which the stiffness had shown earlier, and uh, for the for and for the healthy cases and the uh, delaminated cases of the box beam as well. So in the box beam again, the what we had observed is that the the effect of delamination is observable if the Layer that we have considered is more asymmetric, but during if the layer is more of symmetric nature, then the delamination effect is very negligible. So we had considered in this case a more of a symmetric layer, so the the effect of delamination on the frequency is negligible. But when we consider a different layer, uh, it's more predominant. Uh, further, we have uh, uh, done some uh, wave propagation validations with the FE results. Uh, so, so for the wave propagation analysis, we had used the Hanning window uh, force input with uh, with with the uh, with a frequency of five kilohertz, and uh, we had observed uh, and we had computed the wave response using uh, spectral finite element method and the one D equivalent mod beam method. 
so using that, uh, when we compare both our FE results and SFE uh, uh, from the wave propagation, so again, we have a very close match with the 3D results. Um, Again, uh, we this the upper two are for the pre-twisted beams, and the lower one is for the uh, for the for the delaminated strip. Uh, so we see that uh, although there is a difference in the amplitude uh, with the uh, with the finite with the finite element model, but the, the but the wave velocity of our model matches very well with the the wave velocity that's predicted by the simulations in FE. And in the in the FE, uh, it's important to uh, even provide contact constraints, proper contact con const constraints at the delamination zone to capture the wave response properly. And now we can now uh, uh, create a huge profile for uh, we can create a profile for the uh, group velocity or the dispersion plots for various conditions and for the various delamination conditions. Uh, so here I've shown it for one case, uh, and we and the general generally we can observe a decrease in the uh, wave velocity when there is a delamination. And from this uh, results, we can determine how much will be how much would be the decrease in the wave velocity when the when the you know, because of the delamination and because of partial delamination. And this analysis can be now, and we can once we have the wave response for very various delamination dimensions, uh, we can now uh, create a uh, create a cre create a curve, create a response uh, based on the damage index that we can use. So here I've just used the damage index. Here the damage index can be uh, can be expressed in terms of amplitude and the wave velocity. So as we see, as you can see. Uh, in the top figure, the, the wave velocity is decreasing uh, with the delamination and also the amplitude is decreasing. And this is the axial torsion coupled mode. Uh, so this mode has not been um, of much, uh, has not been in much of study because of the reasons, uh, because the difficulty of uh, capturing it, but uh, we were able to do it in the in, in this case. And for the and even for in the case of torsional speed, we can see the torsional speed reducing uh, non-linearly with the delamination, whereas the uh, the axial torsion coupling is reducing linearly. And the displacement, uh, as we know, has to increase for the torsional beam as the as the delamination size increases. Um, again, uh, we have done the same kind of analysis for the flexural response of the beam. Uh, so we see a flexural response increasing uh, and the flexural velocity decreasing linearly. Uh, so these these kind of analysis provides much more uh, much more greater understanding of the wave response in the presence of delam in the presence of partial delamination and this can be helpful in early detection of delamination in the beams in in the beams. Yeah. And we have done a, uh, again a more a validation kind of uh, uh, study for the for a six cross section beam with the literature uh, by uh, Yaman, and we see that our the for the six cross section beam the wave the the dispersion plots are uh, pretty close to the one that is proposed by Yaman. And again, but in in the open cross section beam, uh, the wave the wave velocity changes are very less. But the wave displacements are huge, uh, which are which is shown here. So in the open and closed cross section beam, uh, to to capture to detect the uh, to to detect the partial delamination, uh, uh, displacements uh, capturing the displacements will be more helpful than looking at the wave velocities because uh, because now it's it's more of an assembly of multiple strips. So the effect of uh, of, of a strip at another point might be and might be more or less depending on the coupling elastic coupling involved in the beam. Yeah. So uh, in in summary, like uh, we have developed or we have established an one D equivalent uh, dynamic and static model for a strip and open and close cross section B, and uh, even uh, for which we have even developed the spectral finite element formulation for analyzing the beams in the in in under uh, transient loads, and we have performed validation studies uh, to show the equivalence between 1D model and the 3D model, 
And uh, yeah, and uh, to conclude, uh, I would say that um, the 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 current model is helpful in analyzing more in analyzing the behavior of open and closed cross section or any thin walled uh, beams in the presence of partial delamination uh, because we get more insights through the through the changes in the displacements uh, uh, so through the change by observing the changes in the displacement so in the stiffness uh, matrix we can we can infer we can infer the macro behavior of the uh, beams or open and closed cross section beams under static and dynamic loads and uh, these uh, it's 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 and it's uh, very difficult to generalize these stiffness behavior with the pre twist and the delamination because it would depend on the layup and the position where the delamination is uh, uh, located or positioned in the cross section of the beam and uh, even the frequent even the frequency reduction uh, is dependent on the mode uh, rather than uh, so some modes may uh, change drastically and but some modes may change very slowly so these are a few conclusions that we can uh, make out from the uh, from the study yeah thank you for the uh, yeah i would like to thank uh, professor guru prasad and uh, professor haru sampath for giving me an opportunity to present and yeah that's it so Thank you for the presentation. Very comprehensive, uh, very a lot of study on the beam, and um, of course it um, would need from my side more time to understand everything. But I have a few, a couple of questions if I can. So one I think was a slide the circuit two. Yes. So, um, so in the so in the uh, in the lower part, you are comparing uh, um, with the finite element. Yes. So the finite element is a three D model. Is a two D model? How are you considering the the cross section? So it's a box cross section. So uh, the so the box beam was modeled using a shell shell elements. Uh, so the wall of the beam can be uh, can can be considered 2D, but the overall it's a 3D uh, structure. So how can you explain uh, the difference if the, um, on the higher frequency? I think uh, um, between the finite element model and your formulation, because then uh, the the differences are becoming uh, higher. Yes. Yes. So yeah, this model is good for. We have observed this model is good for uh, 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 lower frequencies, but as the frequencies increase, now the even the effect of local warpings has to be considered in the time domain. So that that has to be considered again, computed again uh, with respect to the time. So that be, then then the problem will become non-linear and iterative. So that's the reason why we have observed certain differences in the at higher frequencies. I am sorry. Can you repeat again? Why is it because it's nonlinear? I don't. I think that. No. No. Uh, no. Uh, we haven't considered the effect of local displacements or local warpings as an effect as an as a as a function of time as as a dependent of time. While modeling. And it's a, a little bit strange because the frequency uh, you in your model are growing. So and these are getting more difficult, different from the finite element. But then there is the last one that is smaller. So I don't know yeah. what the 7 fs 3 represent, but why is it small? I am looking only at the healthy part. Okay. So the, Pristine beam. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's again uh, dependent on the uh, on on the. Uh, 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 I would say I would say that uh, because uh, here in in the uh, um, 
be, be, the whopping constraints might be one of the reasons, uh, uh, the reasons why we are seeing such a difference, such we are, why we are observing such difference for the uh, coupled modes. Because in the, again, in the finite element, when I consider a 3D model, so I don't have any constraints on the local warpings now. So now there are, there can be these local warpings contributing to the, uh, some modes predominantly at higher frequencies. So that's, that can be the reasons. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so I'm a master's student here and I'm also working on a similar area. So could you go to the static validation case that uh, you have showed? Uh, I think it's in 20s. And this one? No, it's with the uh, Haru uh, Yeah, that, that one. So here you're considering uh, elastic twist coupling, right? Yes. So for 1D case, uh, you're using the stiffness matrix that you get from the cross-sectional analysis. Yes. How are you solving the 1D equation? Uh, actually, it's, it's solvable. You can directly get the uh, closed form solution it's for the... So yeah, I did not go, I did not present it, but yeah, I can get the closed form solution for the uh, partial differential equation for the governing partial equation equation that I showed earlier. So using the closed form solution that I can, for static cases, I can get the closed form solution, not for the dynamic cases, yeah. For this part, this uh, partial differential equation in eight can be solved to, I mean, I can, uh, uh, to get the solution for it. Static validation, you used an MSG. Uh, what is that MSG? Oh, MSG stands for uh, uh, material, uh, method of structural genome. So, in, in that method, in the MSG method, they have used the finite element, uh, but we, here we are not using any finite element. So, we are, uh, we are completely analytically modeling the Sorry, we are, we, are, we are modeling the structural genome analytically and using that to find the uh, stiffness of open and closed cross section moves. So that's the difference between the MSG model and our analytical model. It's semi analytical, yes. Thank you for the question. Uh, Sorry? Can, uh, can I ask a difficult question? Sure, Mark. So you presented a lot of uh, beam theory. So you put in the references a lot of beam theory yes. and you compare with some of them at one point and then the other point, depending on the beam theory. So what is the advantage to have this new uh, beam theory? Uh, one one is like um, the uh, although there are a few assumptions in the beam, but uh, the we haven't assumed any kind of uh, we haven't pre-assumed any displacement uh, uh, formulations uh, uh, for the local warping. So the local warpings are derived based on the minimization principles. So that gives more generalization for the uh, for the for the um, beam compared to other beam theories. Which would assume some kind of form, some kind of form for the local uh, displacements, and the um, second part would, is that uh, uh, there are no, like at least to our uh, in, in to our knowledge, there are no other models that have presented partial uh, that have presented the partial delamination uh, for um, such an open and closed cross section beam, or even for a simple strip. So uh, our model was ab is able to predict uh, the the uh, the, degrad the degradation in elastic couplings as well as uh, with the delamination as well as pre twist uh, 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 much more efficiently compared to the other models with the partial delamination. So yeah, these are the main uh, advantages of the current model. 
Hi, Puneet. Uh, this is Panindra. Uh, so, in the case of delamination, you are considering it as a damage or just a debonding between the elements, like or the nodes. In the in the uh, are, are you asking in the um, for the um, case of uh, uh, finite element simulations? No, in the VAM, in the VAM itself. Okay. Uh, okay, in the VAM, we are considering it as a two sub two different sublaminates uh, when there is a delamination. Uh, so, so that it's more of a sublaminate approach uh, than the. Uh, we are not considering any kind of nodes, uh, or uh, it's not a computational model to, to yeah, to consider any kind of nodes or uh, such things. So, even in the finite element, there is no damage uh, modeling kind of thing initiated, right? It's just a delaminated like uh, tie constraints yes. have not been caught. That's all. Yes. Okay. And you have mentioned like uh, when you have the delamination in the web, you are not finding any change in the stiffness. But when you are having the delamination in the flange, you are finding the stiffness difference. Am I right? Yes. Yes. So why do you think so? It is happening. Is it because of the axis of uh, twist you are having? Because of that, you are finding the difference, or is there any other reason behind it? So the the so the one thing that I observed again is uh, when the delamination is presented uh, in such a region where it is more of a restraint. So if you are if you are looking into the web, so the web is more restrained in the at the top and the bottom. Uh, so the warping. So if we are considering any delamination in those regions, those are have those are having lesser effects because the displacements in those regions are constraints. Constraint, but when we are considering in the flange, uh, which is more as which is uh, in which case we are having a more of a free edge uh, in the flanges. So over there we have a much more uh, dominant uh, dis uh, local displacements. So that's the reason why we are observing such uh, changes. Uh, why we are seeing uh, huge changes when there is free warping in the flanges uh, compared to the restrained warping in the uh, web. Okay, it is because of the boundary conditions we are having. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, yes. Got it. Thank you, thank you. So, as a, a last a comment, so if you go back on a, one of the few first slides where you presented some references, when you introduce the topic. Yes, stop here. No, no, later. Now, later. Yes, here, number eight. So, this one was my professor. <laughs> <laughs> so, you are mentioning in a virtual work approach uh, the professor Javotto, 19 et al., in 1983. That was my professor, my mentor. So, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's my. <laughs> My pleasure to present in front of you. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you yeah, for it's a nice surprise. Very nice. Yeah. We mentioned before all the uh, Professor uh, James Johnson when it's uh, there. They said, Look. So still there. Yeah. yeah, I think you introduced him. Yeah, I can't just sit there. Now it is retired. But, yeah. So, Puneet, uh, taking back to uh, Professor Visarni's first question, uh, where the uh, for the healthy structure, the um, frequencies uh, tend to overlap in terms of you draw a curve uh, when you go from, uh, I think, the sixth mode to the seventh mode. Um, I think that question is kind of a loaded question. You need to look at uh, the validity of that finite element method as well. What software you use, what kind of element you used, and how reliable that is. And uh, typically, I think uh, she also asked whether it's 2D or 3D model, and you mentioned it's 2D. So uh, typically, you tend to uh, correlate with 3D models uh, and show how close it is to the 3D finite elements. And uh, then you show the, uh, in terms of the CPU time, how much of an advantage you have uh, by using your method as compared to theirs. Uh, so I think um, uh, if it's not because it's just a box beam, I believe that case, uh, it's not. I don't think it's a very difficult thing to do a 3D finite element analysis uh, for that case, and probably uh, that's something that you can explore so that you can try to explain uh, why that particular phenomena happens. Uh, it's kind of an interesting observation. Yes, sir. Sure, sure. I will uh, look into it.
uh, yeah, one more thing. Uh, I mean, your name is Puneet, uh, which means pure. Uh, <laughs> but still, I will uh, uh, use the uh, this particular phrase. Uh, looking at some of the equations that you showed on this slide, uh, put me into an intellectual orgasm. Uh, the time came to a standstill because <laughs> um, I was just talking to Javier uh, here on our car ride back from Airbus. He was mentioning uh, when we work on certain things, um, we, uh, it, it time comes to a standstill. It's more like a meditative state that we get into. And uh, some of those at that time, of course, I didn't know that it was a meditative experience. Uh, but nonetheless, um, I mean, I still get into that when, when you show some of those equations. Uh, so I really am uh, happy uh, with this work. It's very comprehensive because having worked in this field, I know how much of effort has gone into it. Um, uh, uh, of course, Professor Guru Prasad men mentioned my work as the seminal work for this. Uh, his work with me as the, one of the first master's students um, was also kind of seminal to that because it added the component of delamination. And then you have taken it uh, further down because I uh, looked at only uh, open cross sections. You looked at closed cross sections. Uh, before Professor Guru Prasad was pref uh, Professor Shetikanto Roy. My first master's student was now a professor at IIT Delhi, and uh, he actually attempted the box beam. That was uh, his first uh, master's problem, and he gave up after a year or so. And he's one of the brilliant students. So, uh, uh, so I really commend you in terms of that work. Um, I would um, probably be envious of uh, who are your uh, PhD thesis reviewers because they should have had a really good time if they were uh, able to appreciate uh, what kind of work uh, has happened uh, in, in order to achieve this. Uh, so um, once again, congratulations on, an, uh, on a really excellent piece of work, and I hope uh, you'll do even better with your postdoctoral uh, fellowship in the US. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, uh, thank you, Professor Arur Sampath, for uh, really those encouraging uh, remarks and uh, words. Uh, and also, I thank you and uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, primarily uh, for giving uh, some of the comments. Uh, so one issue, as uh, probably both of you uh, would know, is when we compare 3D finite elements with reduced order moderates. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, so currently I'm teaching finite element methods here at IIT Bombay. And just in yesterday's class, I asked to the students, suppose you were to do a 1D bar problem. Okay, what is the boundary condition? It's fixed at one end and it is subjected to a simple axial load. What is the boundary boundary condition that you would apply? The answer was very straightforward. All the students said at one end for one node, we fix displacement U to be equal to zero. Then I asked, suppose now you have a 3D problem. It's a 3D uh, problem and it's the same bar problem. What is the boundary condition that you apply? And the immediate answer was for one entire plane, we will fix all the degrees of freedom. The problem is, as you all know, if you fix all the degrees of freedom, the problem will not have any Poisson-like effect. And, and it will not mimic the same 1D bar problem result, especially closer to the place where you have the boundary condition. And, and of course, in the 1D problem, the Poisson effect is not really appearing, whereas in 3D it is appearing. So to really make the 3D problem mimic the 1D problem, a lot more care needs to be taken care when we apply the boundary condition. Now, this is a big problem that we especially face when we are having these reduced order models with kinematics, which can do a number of other things which the 3D FEM uh, may not directly account for, because there we are essentially dealing more often than not with only three degrees of freedom per node. Uh, so, so applying the boundary condition is a big challenge and uh, that's where a uh, lot of time we have spent uh, in the validation. Uh, so, so I do agree with your comments and we will go back and look into it. Although I doubt if we will find 
a better solution. Uh, but yeah, that's one remark that I wanted to share with all of you. Uh, that's right, Guru. Um, that, was, that, that was a nice summary. Um, I mean, it's quite convincing for those of us in the community who have worked on VAM for a long period of time. But to convince uh, anybody else who is new to the community, um, I think these are certain things that we need to do as an exercise uh, because that makes it um, much more uh, uh, receptive uh, for th those kinds of audiences. Um, I mean, because I, I feel one of the reasons why VAM, in spite of its humongous power, uh, has not been as popular. One, of course, it's a, is it's a steep learning curve in terms of the terminology and the kind of uh, uh, mathematically pure language that uh, Professor Berdichevsky has written some of his first papers in. But the other is also in terms of, um, I think we, we, uh, we as a community um, are not making sufficient effort in terms of explaining it to um, uh, people who don't have an understanding of that terminology, to put it in uh, the words that they typically use uh, to describe the same concepts. I think um, that that's something that I think with a little bit of effort, we can probably uh, enlarge the scope of uh, uh, VAM and its applications, and uh, I see you as one of the uh, leaders in the community uh, uh, because this is not the only thesis I have seen of yours, but uh, quite a few other students' PhD uh, thesis of, from your group, uh, which I'm really proud of. Thank you, thank you. So, so we will uh, definitely make an effort, and your comment essentially means it's time, I guess, all of us get together and write a textbook on uh, VAM-based. Uh, strip and structures. I think it's long overdue. Uh, I, I believe uh, this is probably the time to really look at it seriously sure. under your guidance. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, I think recently, uh, some of the emails that I sent back to them, uh, where when they get stuck up on something, uh, I, try, I try to explain to them how to go about doing that. Even if we just collect those, I think uh, that will be a nice manual, a practical manual. Yes. <laughs> uh, I think that can be kind of a seed from which all of you guys can contribute. And I will also uh, do so. Uh, so I think uh, this has been, in fact, a request from a lot of the students um, uh, time and again uh, that we should have a book. Of course, we have Professor Berdichevsky's books. We have Professor Hodges' book. Um, but um, each of them were geniuses. And uh, sometimes the uh, problem or issue with geniuses is that they think everybody who reads their book is a genius as well. And <laughs> so, so I think uh, we have to kind of um, cater to a much wider audience. And I think uh, that is possible, especially uh, considering the volume of work that uh, uh, our group has done. Uh, I mean, yesterday I was talking to um, uh, Shritika, uh, I mean, Shrikant's student. And um, also, I think uh, quite a few uh, graduates from all of your labs. I think uh, with this, we have enough um, work to probably uh, come up with a, a good monogram. Yes, yes. Yeah, and Thank it's you. good. Uh, yeah. uh, Professor Bisani also mentioned uh, Professor Giomoto uh, because Professor yes. Hodge had very great regard yeah. for him. Yeah, he yeah. used to yeah. mention him a lot. Yeah. I don't know if they even have a common paper. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I think, yeah. uh, I think uh, some of it. Bori, I think, uh, probably. Yeah, had, because Bori right. was uh, studied with Jonathan. Ah, I went to Georgia Tech okay, okay. for some time. So in some sense, then we are cousins. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I can, yeah, and I can assure you that it's not a coincidence uh, that uh, we have put it uh, there. I mean, uh, we don't want to miss any seminal work, so we do believe uh, his contribution to be immense, and that's why uh, it's there. It's just coincidence that you happen to be in the audience, uh, but otherwise, uh, you know, I think right from uh, uh, one of the first presentations that Puneet has given, uh, that name uh, has been there as part of his presentation. Uh, that's so, really good. yeah, I'm, uh, I'm glad to, to know this. I know that he is one of the first the developer some beam theory, mainly for helicopter mm. applications for, yes. for blade, 
Yeah, and then I know that was studied the Georgia Tech uh, people studied his work. I don't think he never okay. went, but a student of him went to Georgia Tech. So. Okay. It's a lot when I say that uh, Professor Hodges had regard for him because he has high regards for very few people. That was one of the Thank you. Thank you very much, Guru. Yeah, we'll catch up. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We'll move on to the next Bye. talk.